right, let's dig into the next lesson, which is um, living victoriously in Christ. This is our spiritual maturity dynamics level one, lesson 10A. We all need to learn how to live victoriously in Christ to have what we like to call the great life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. You are no longer who you were, what you were when Jesus comes into your life. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Praise God. I am not who I used to be, and I'm thankful for that because there was a lot of garbage in my old life. And, and even though I may not see the evidence of everything that I am now, um, it's, it's a, still a truth that I'm living and practicing in order for my life to match up those things that God has now declared my life to be. So let's dig into the lesson here. We are starting with this idea of living victorious, fulfilling lives. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And because of that position, we can live in victory and authority over the enemy. Hallelujah. This victory is here and now. Not just in, the, in heaven for eternity, but even living it right now. Knowing who we are in Christ releases the power to walk in victory over everything that the enemy might try to bring your way. When we take hold of this truth, we'll realize victory. When we when are ignorant of that truth, we become easy prey to the devil. Because again, he's a lot smarter than us. How, we, how do we become more knowledgeable and wise is to learn his ways through the word of God, to know God's word in order to implement it and, and come against the, the lies that he tries to implement. All right. So again, we are new cre cre creatures, excuse me, when we come to Christ, right? When we ask him into our life, when we repent of our sins, acknowledge our need for Jesus, invite him in as Lord of our, of our lives, we are new creations. We're spiritually reborn. We're now sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. And we have privileges due to that position as we are day by day transformed as we grow in the knowledge of who we are in Christ. So let's talk about four main areas that this is true in our lives. Roman numeral one says, you receive new life when you come to Christ. Oh, praise God. But again, we were spiritually dead. Now we have a new life in Christ. We're no longer that old person. A, you now have eternal life. Emphasis on now. It didn't again doesn't start later. When we are born again, that the, the spirit of that is in us becomes alive through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we begin that life of eternity, you might say, at that very moment. It doesn't happen way down in the future. Right then and right there, we are having that eternal life. B, you have God's love poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit. It's an awesome thing to grow in the knowledge that God loves us. Oh my goodness, God loves us. It, it, I, how do I even express that or explain that? How do I even understand why? But yet he does. C, you have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 16, right? As I, again, it, primarily as I put the word of God inside of me, but also by the empowering of the Holy Spirit, now I can begin to see things as Christ sees them. I no longer have to see things as the world sees them, but I can see them as Christ. I mean, my, my mental ability is being transformed. D, your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. As you become born again, the Holy Spirit comes and resides inside of you. And this is found in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, right? Now he's inside of you. You are the temple. He, he living inside of you. E, you have available to you the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts, okay? Not just, not just that you're still going about your life the way it was, but now the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is evident in your life as you, especially if you, if you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we talked about in a, in a previous lesson, 
Um, we can start to operate in the healing and the words of knowledge and, and giving uh, uh, tongues and interpretation, words of faith, all of these things that are wrapped in that God now makes these available to us. And this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. F, you have the Holy Spirit as a seal of ownership in your heart. When you invite Jesus in as Lord, he places the Holy Spirit inside of you, kind of like a deposit. I usually refer to this idea, and again, I don't know, maybe I'm dating myself just a little bit here, but this idea of when you would do a layaway. Lots of people would do that during Christmas time, right? They would go through the store with their cart. Yes, I want this for Jimmy. Yes, I want this for Sally. And whatever, grandma's going to get this. And some, my husband, my wife, whatever. And we put it in our basket. And there would be this place in the back of the store where they would take it and they would tabulate it up, just like you're going to pay for it right that moment, give you a total, and you would put a deposit. You would put some portion of that down to say, these things are things that I want and they belong to me, and I've made a deposit, I'm going to come back and get them. Guess what? Jesus puts that deposit of the Holy Spirit, and what he's doing uh, by that is saying, you belong to me. I am coming back for you. Oh, isn't that an awesome thing? Oh, G, you are redeemed from the curse of the law. Galatians 3.13. The biggest part of that curse, of course, is death, that we, we deserve death. The law says, do not steal, and then we steal, and then the curse comes upon us, and we have the penalty of death resting upon us. But now we are redeemed. We're set free. We, that thing's been broken. It's been paid for. Basically, the meaning of redeem is that the thing has been paid for. I no longer have to pay it. It's been paid for by Jesus Christ and what he did upon the cross. H, you are made alive with Christ. Colossians 2, 13. And, it, and, I, and I like that emphasis, with Christ. You know, we're not just walking this life by ourselves. We're not just walking it without any help or, okay, just, hey, do the best you can and I'll check in on you later kind of thing. No, Jesus is with us right now and we're living this life through his empowerment, right? Again, that speaks to that victory that we started off with. Victory in this life, not just going through it, suffering, and somehow just squeaking by. No, but we're alive with Christ. I, you are renewed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, you've been changed. And now there's like this, this new energy that's flowing through you. You know, sometimes, and I think sometimes it comes out because of the purpose. We're now given a purpose in life. And it renews us. It strengthens us. Uh, it, 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 it just transforms how we are. We're not just, you know, drudgingly going through life. But now we have something to live for. And that Holy Spirit just begins to stir that up inside of us. J, you are born again of the Word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23. God's Word gets inside of us and it transforms us, right? It, it makes us new. It, it transforms our thinking. Romans 12, 2, right? That we're <clears throat> transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're taking the old garbage out, all the stuff that the enemy in life has poured into you, saying you're worthless or you're no good and God doesn't love you, you know, whatever else kind of stuff, and you're taking that out and, and you're putting a new thing in. I liken it to the, the, a computer that's got a virus, right? We, we clean the hard drive and we put fresh, new, in this case, powerful truth uh, as the new template for what we're working with. K, you are forgiven and washed clean in Jesus' blood. 1 John 1, verse 7 through 9. The word right there, especially in verse 9, says, if we will confess our sins, if we will acknowledge our sins, it will say, yes, I have sinned. His promises in that moment is to offer forgiveness. It's not something that we have to keep working for and begging for, but the biggest key is simply that we acknowledge it, right? And we are forgiven. Hallelujah. You know what it's like to be forgiven? To not be carrying that weight around anymore. To, to, to worry about, you know, am I acceptable? God is saying, you are acceptable. I receive you. L, you are born of God. 1 John 2, 29. You are a child of God. You belong to the family, right? He's adopted you in with all the privileges that are part of that. And that's just part, again, of this new life that we're living. Roman numeral 2 says, you enter into a new relationship with God. And I know in, 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 within the, 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 the church body here at Great Life, 
a lot of the things that we're trying to stress is that it is about relationship. We didn't have a relationship. Really, it was a just and wrath-filled God who had every right to judge us for the sins that we were committing, the rejection of his, of his purposes and all that, right? But now, and we were at odds. We were, you know, we were, we were separated in relationship. But now because we ask Jesus into our life, we receive him, right? We now have a restored, reconciled relationship with God. A, you become a child of God. I've already kind of touched on it already, that we now belong to the family. God is our Father. Father. And we mean that like in relationship, not just some title, but that we can call to him Father. And think about how we as husbands, you know, as fathers ourselves, excuse me, you know, how we deal with our children, even mothers with their children, how we feel about them. That's how God feels about because we're his child. John chapter 1, verse 12, Romans 8, 15 through 16. B, you have peace with God. Right? You don't have to be worried that he's angry with you or all that kind of stuff, but rather you know that he loves you, that he's working on your behalf, he's begun a good work in your life, and every day he's working at it and he's speaking into your life, and that just brings a peace, a peace because you know that your life is in his hands. He's guiding these things. Right? Sometimes that's where peace kind of gets missing because we think there's, there's nobody at the, at the controls and nobody at the steering wheel, as it were. God is at the uh, controls. He is guiding things in our life. That's found in Romans 5.1. C, you are reconciled to God. Romans 5.10. I spoke briefly on this already. There was a relationship that was, had been destroyed. Had been As soon as we entered into that, you know, we have a sin nature, but as soon as we made that decision to engage that and do the things we weren't supposed to do, we separated in that relationship. But now because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have opportunity. We say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you. Come into my life. And now that relationship is restored. It's reconciled. The differences between us have been eliminated. D, you become a joint heir with Christ, Romans 8, 17. Everything that Jesus is going to inherit, everything that is a part of his a treasure, you might say, also belongs to you and I when we become a saint of the living God. What an awesome thing. E, you are Christ's possession, 1 Corinthians 3, 23. Now, that doesn't speak to a, this idea of slavery or something. I want you to think about something that you possess. Maybe you worked for it. You went down to the store. You purchased it. It was valuable to you. Huh? So see, we are valuable to Christ. We belong to him and he treasures us and he spends time with us and he speaks into our life. So we are Christ's possession. F. You are a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. We read that at the beginning of this lesson. Again, that just again speaks that what we used to be, we are no longer. I often speak of this idea, and I, this is not to bash anything like that, uh, the, the, the organization AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. They have this thing, you know, they, they'll sit in a circle and different ones will come up or maybe they're doing it from their chair and they'll say, hey, my name is uh, Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Joe. But in the Christian sense of things, Joe is no longer an alcoholic. He is now set free from that. He has a different descriptive thing that's you know, to say who he is. He's not an alcoholic. Does that mean he's not tempted, that he's not struggling, or whatever it might be? No. But he's progressing from what he was, the old creation, and becoming in alignment with what he is now in the new creation. Uh, G, you are crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. That means my old life has been put to death. It doesn't have dominion over me any longer. You know, so many, people, so many believers struggle with the past sins, the past temptations, right? But that person is dead. It's, they're buried. We are now a new living creature in Christ. H, you are accepted in the beloved. And this is found in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. We're accepted. Oh my goodness. Jesus accepts us. God the Father accepts us. He welcomes us into his presence. He welcomes us into his family. He welcomes us up into his arms and he holds us. We are accepted, right? He loves us. I, 
You are alive with Christ. Ephesians 2, 5. We're not dead. We're not just, you know, hanging out all kind of limp. No, we are alive. We have purpose. We have things to do, commissions that we have received to go out and share the good news with others, right? And that just gives us a purpose, a light, something to live, to wake up for. Amen? J, you are a member of God's household. Ephesians 2.19. You see a lot of repetition. This is just a listing of scriptures. They're talking about what your position is in the family of God. You're a part of the household, right? You you know how mom and dad have their room and sis has got a room and this brother's got a room and you got a place too. You live in the house, right? The things of the house. And, and there's things that you can do in the household that you can't do if you go visit somebody else's household, right? If you go over to your, to, uh, your friend's house uh, parents' house kind of thing. When you were a kid, you couldn't just go rummaging through the cupboards for food, right? Or take a toothbrush and to brush, you know, you just didn't do those things because it's not your house. But you are a part of God's household. You can walk in the victory that God has given you. Amen. K, you can approach God with freedom and confidence. Ephesians 3.12. Isn't that an amazing thing? I don't have to come in all meek and shy. Now, again, it doesn't mean to be irreverent or disrespectful. It means that I don't have to think that my God is just ready to snow. Forget it. I didn't do it kind of thing. I have this harsh tone with us like sometimes we've experienced with our own parents, right? But he wants us to bring our needs to him. He wants us to come into his presence. He lives for them. And we have the freedom to do that. Now, we don't have to be like some other religions where we got to go to the high, the high priest or some other uh, in-between person. We can come to God the Father on our own because we're his child. L, you can be confident that he who began a good work in you will complete it. Philippians 1, 6, right? When you came to the Lord, he took who you were. And I, again, he loved you. He loved you. It doesn't necessarily mean, some people think that he, when he, we say he loves you, it means that he just, he's, he's happy with just where you're at. And that's not exactly what that means. It doesn't mean that he's judging us. It doesn't mean that he's putting us down. But when he receives us, he says, hey, you know what? There's something better for your life. And so, so there's some things in your life that need to change. Not because I'm putting you down, but because you want these things. If I have anger in my life and I'm venting and I'm, I'm destroying relationships, I'm destroying my own life. I don't want that in my life. And God knows that as well. So he begins to work. He takes you as he receives you and then begins to work on you because he loves you too much to leave you in the state that he received you, right? And, and this work that he began on the day that you enter into a relationship with him, he is doing every single day until you go to be with him in heaven for eternity. Hallelujah. M, you can do all things through Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.13, anything that God calls you to do, you can do it. There's nothing hindering you except your own willingness to step into it. Does that always mean that you're going to succeed at every single thing? You know, sometimes people don't understand that failing at something, making an attempt and kind of coming up short is actually a good thing. It helps us to learn. Okay, that's not a good way to do that. I'm going to steer clear of that in the future, right? Or I saw something, you know, this kind of element worked and, and just we learn things right? It's not that God's um, promoting failure, but rather that is we have to understand whatever God calls us to step in and just do the best we can by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We can do all things through Christ. Hallelujah. And you are qualified to share in his inheritance. Colossians 1, 12. We have been put in a place where we can stand in line at the inheritance line, as you might say. And when we get up to the counter and say, um, yes, I'm here to receive my inheritance. Yes, sir, you may receive that. Whatever it is, uh, authority in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, right? All these things that we're talking about, you are qualified by through Jesus Christ. Oh, you participate in the divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4. Again, we, we have the life of God inside of us. We no longer have to do the things that the flesh tells us to do. We have the power to make a different decision, to be victorious in these things. God has put that inside of us. Roman numeral three, here's another set of things. Have I, have I given you so many already? Well, there's still more. Roman numeral three, you are set free from sin. 
Okay? It no longer has dominion over you. It no longer has power over you. It no longer can just tell you what to do. You may think it does. I just can't stop doing this. I'm just struggling with this. No, by the word of God, you are set free. You're a new creation. It no longer has dominion over you. A, you are set free from bondage. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 31 through 36. It doesn't have power. You can't hold you down. I can't go anywhere. I'm powerless. No, that's a complete lie from the enemy. You have been set free. Again, it's a matter of accessing it and then walking into it. B, you are set free from sin. Romans 6, 18. Again, it doesn't have the authority over you. It doesn't have the power over you to just get you to do what it wants you to do whenever it wants you to do it. No, you can say, no, I am not doing that. I'm choosing God's way. C, you are no longer under condemnation. Romans 8, 1. Right? The enemy tries to come along and say, look how bad you are. Look what you did. I thought you said you were a Christian. But you know what? God doesn't look at it that. As we acknowledge our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is no condemnation in that scenario. The enemy, again, he wants to lie to you. He's trying to draw you back into that old life. God came to set you free. D, you are saved from the consequences of sin. Romans 10, 13. Now, this is speaking specifically about eternity in hell. You know, eternal condemnation, that sort of thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that if you do something wrong, that there may not be a consequence that you have to deal with because of that. But rather, the, the shame, right? Or that how that the guilt of that will cause you to kind of wander off from God. No, you don't have to be under those consequences. Because you have the freedom. Listen to this. Listen to this. Now you have the freedom to acknowledge when you're wrong. Why? Because you know God loves you no matter what. He's not, oh, you sin, forget you, get out of here. That's not how he's operating. Rather, he's just waiting for you to say, Father, I blew it again, I, and I confess that to you right now. And immediately you have access to forgiveness, and your life has been cleansed from that. So the consequences of lingering in that and continuing to build on that lie upon lie upon lie, you no longer have to suffer from that. E, you have been made righteous and holy. 1 Corinthians 1.30. In other words, you have been declared, you are right before God. You have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. You can live towards God's purposes in your life. F, you are washed, sanctified, and justified. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, right? I'm cleansed of my sin. His life is inside of me. I've been set apart for God's purposes, right? I can stand before God free and holy. Like we talked earlier about the freedom and the, and the confidence we come before God. G, you are no longer, or excuse me, you no longer gratify the cravings of your sinful nature. Ephesians 2, 3. Some of you might be saying, I think I'm um, gratifying quite a bit. But the point is, is that it doesn't have the same um, taste to it any longer. It doesn't satisfy any longer. It's starting to lose its grip on you. You don't longer want to do those things. I don't want to, you know, even when you're still struggling with something and you find yourself still falling into it time and time again, I remember, you know, it seems like there's always something in a person's life that they just stumble over and stumble over, right? And, I, and I've had those things in my own life. And, it, and here's the thing. There's no joy in it. it, it it's, it's fleeting. It passes. You think you have to have it and you, and you get into it and it's like, eh, it just doesn't have it like it used to. Why? Because your nature has been changed. I don't want to gratify those things. I don't want those things in my life. Okay? H, you are complete in Christ. Colossians 2.10. There's nothing lacking. You have everything you need. Everything you should desire and, and, and require in order to fulfill what God has called your life to be, you have it right now. All you're doing is trying to learn what it is. It's like you've been given a garage full of tools and here I am talking about the most unmechanical person on the planet. You're given this garage of tools. You may not know how all of them operate or what they could be used for, but you're going to learn. And that's the same thing with Christ. But we have the tools that have already been given to us. 
I, you have a new nature, Colossians 3, 9 through 10. I don't have a sin nature. Now I have a God nature. I'm, I'm acclimating myself to the things of God. I no longer want to do the things that the sin nature was, is always provoking me to do. J, you are cleansed from a guilty conscience, Hebrews 10, 22. Again, that, that, that thing that the enemy kind of feeds it a little bit, but this idea that when you do something wrong, that you just keep living over and, and, and mucking up in it kind of thing. Like, I can never come to God. And, and you know, it's a funny thing. Sometimes we all come to church and we're in that state and, and, and we won't come up and just let it go to God and be cleansed and, and move forward from it. It's difficult. It's like we feel like we have to suffer something. We have to do something. And again, that, that's contrary to the principles of the kingdom of God. It's not about you doing something. When I do things for the kingdom of God, I do it as a response of love for his love for me. Not because I'm trying to make up for something. You can't make up for sin, right? All you can do is bring it to God and say, God, I, I, I acknowledge my sin before you. I repent. I don't want it in my life. Cleanse me. And he does right then. Right? You are healed. 1 Peter 2, 24. God is pouring his, his spirit upon you and he's, he's renewing you physically, renewing you mentally. All of these things are brand new. He's healing. There's a healing process, but primarily healing of your spirit that you're not being drugged down by all the things that used to drag you down in life. L, you are dead to sin and alive to righteousness. 1 Peter 2, 24. That again goes right back to the thing we said before where I, I, I don't want those things that I used to do. I, I want to pursue those things that God has declared over my life. There's a, there's a changing. There's a, a switching. That's what repentance means. I'm going in this direction. I make a decision by the power of the Holy Spirit, the life of Christ inside of me, to go in the opposite direction. M, you are cleansed from past sin. 2 Peter 1, 9. That, that all the stuff that, that used to be a weight and a, a burden and a stain upon you is now gone. There's verses that talk about how, how God takes your sins and throws them into the deepest part of the ocean. He separates you as far as the east is from the west. And I'm just going to take a brief second. Some of you understand that concept, but you've heard it. And you go, wait, what does that exactly mean? So let's just imagine for just a moment that you're standing on the North Pole. Or rather, you're going towards the North Pole. Right? Every step that you take towards the North Pole is north. But then you get to the North Pole, and if you continue to go in a straight line past the North Pole, you are now going south. Okay? The point is, is there's a point where north and south connect. Same thing happens at the South Pole. However, it's not the same dynamic for east and west. If I go east and I just go east, I can go east forever. Or if I choose to go west, I can go west forever. It's as far as the east is from the west. They just keep on going. God separates us from our sin just that far. Hallelujah. Roman numeral four. You are set apart in the world. Set up, in other words, you have been taken out of, the, uh, of the, the culture, as it were, the sin nature stuff, whatever's going on. And now God has put you aside for his purposes. A, you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 37. Isn't that an awesome thing? You're not just a conqueror. When I mean, you think, I'm a conqueror. Oh, yeah. No, you're more than a conqueror. Huh? You're rising even above that. Does it, it doesn't matter what the enemy brings. You can be victorious over every single thing. B, you are an ambassador for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20. And what that means is, when I said something about setting us apart, that doesn't mean that we just, you know, stay away from everything in the world. We're still in this world, and we have a purpose to share the good news with those who still don't know him. But we do that as in the role as of an ambassador. In other words, we have a new citizenship that we have received from the kingdom of heaven. We are its citizens, right? But yet God then leaves us here. You know, again, this is the big question that people don't understand. If the purpose of receiving Jesus Christ is to be saved and, and, and to spend eternity in heaven with God, why are we still here? Think about it. Why are we still here? It's really for one purpose, to tell others about Jesus so that they too may obtain this free gift. And so you're an ambassador. You're from this other kingdom, as it were. You've been placed in the earth, right, to share. 
Yes, I want to tell you about Jesus. We have, and, and, and this is the thing about ambassadors. It's not about our agenda. We're not here to promote our message. We're here to promote the message of the kingdom, of God the Father, of Jesus Christ, those who are the rulers. We've been sent as his uh, emissaries, as it were. Hey, I want to tell you about my leader. I want to tell you about you know, the kingdom of God. Amen? C, you live by faith in the Son of God. Galatians 2.20, okay? Because of my belief, and which gives me strength. Even though I don't see it, even though maybe I don't always have the physical connection of it, but by faith, I know the truth of God's word and I live in it because of Jesus Christ living inside of me. E, you have been raised up with Christ and are seated in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 6. I'm no longer down below. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head and not the tail, says the Bible. I, I, the, I, I, don't, I don't have to look down upon myself or, or, or you know, drag myself across the ground. I have been placed in, 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 a, in a position of royalty, position of leadership in the kingdom of God. That's what God is trying to raise us up, to speak life into those we come in contact with. F, you are a fellow citizen with God's people and a member of God's household. Ephesians 2.19. We talked about the household order. We also talked about the citizenship. We are now citizens of God's kingdom with all the other people. And listen, let me tell you about the family of God. Every brother and sister, not only in the church that you attend, whether it be here or somewhere else, but around the world. You know, it's an amazing thing. One, uh, just a few years back, uh, I had the opportunity to go uh, speak at a number of churches in the country of Hungary. Now, I don't speak Hungarian. And I didn't know anybody over there that, that lives over there in Hungary. We, have a, we had a Hungarian, uh, I should say a pastor that had come from Hungary, was living in the States, but he was still doing missionary work, as it were, back in Hungary. So he would take groups. And so I went to speak at these churches. And here's the crazy thing. Even though I didn't know these people, we're family. I mean, they fed us till we were exploding, literally. You know, just we'd go from one church, pig out, go to the next church, and they want us to pick out too. Like, we just picked out. We don't have room because it was family. They're welcoming me family. We're part of his household. We're part of his family, his people. G, you are rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God. The enemy will try to tell you you're still under his thumb. He still has power over you. That is a lie. You are set free. You have been rescued. You are now in God's kingdom, right? It doesn't have any power over you. It may try to influence you. It may try to push you. But we're speaking about these things because these are the truth of God's word so that when those things happen, you say, wait a minute, that's not God's uh, word over it, right? The Bible talks about bringing every thought into submission to Christ so that when the enemy tries to say something over your life that is not true, tries to bring you down, tries to rob you of the victory, you would say, wait a minute, that is not a God thought. And I bring that, Jesus hears that thought. It is not from you. I, I give it to you under your authority. And I choose to believe the truth of your word. Praise God. H, you have the hope of glory. Oh, again, that word hope doesn't mean wish. Oh, I wish for it. No, hope is a confidence. It, it, it gives me life. I know that I'm going to spend eternity with my Father in heaven. And, and it gives me strength that I don't have to think of this life and all this stuff. Because Things in life, you know, just again, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean everything's going to be perfect. Everything's just going to go your way. There's still struggles and trials. And God is using all things, as he says, all things to work together for good. He's, he's molding us and shaping us by those things. But even so, I know one day I'm going to be with my Father for all eternity. Amen? I, you look forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. This isn't our final destination, right? Your house and where you live and all that kind of stuff, your neighborhood, it's not your final destination. All of that will pass away. One day, you are going to live in heaven. Jesus said he's made mansions, he's made rooms available to us. He's up there kind of has, running the construction crew, if you will, up there, because one day we're going to be with him. And it's going to far, far exceed anything that this life has to offer. And again, that's something that we hold on. And I said in a previous lesson about that if, if we are just living this life to somehow figure out how to live a good life here, but there's no beyond there, then it's, 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 it's a worthless thing, right? Might as well just live and do what we got to do. 
and make it survive because there's nothing beyond this. Oh, hallelujah. There is something beyond this. God's preparing it. And one day we'll be there. And Jay, oh, this is a really cool one here. You can overcome the world. 1 John 5, 4 through 5. Jesus even said that, I have overcome the world. And by virtue of that, he has now empowered us to have the same ability. Nothing, nothing, nothing that comes against you can overwhelm you. Nothing can bring you down. It's, it's up to you to say, no, I choose God's truth. I choose the revelation of the Holy Spirit as he enlightens his word and brings that truth to reality in my life. In other words, it's not just something I'm reading uh, you know, from the pages of my Bible, but it becomes alive through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I recognize that God has declared it over my life, right? Now, whatever life might try to bring me, I can overcome it. Amen? Again, this is not about establishing a kingdom on this planet through political means or whatever kind of stuff that we're talking about. We're talking about overcoming the world so that it doesn't change who God's declared you to be. So that no matter what they do, amen, I can smile, have peace, have joy, because I know who my Savior is. Our position in Christ as a result of salvation is a privilege so great that it's difficult to grasp. We'll be learning about it for the, all of our life. It's far-reaching, life-changing, but yes, it's but it's also real and attainable. And as we begin to understand this true nature of our position, we experience victory over temptation, sin, and even the enemy, the devil, as a reality. We become more than conquerors, overcomers, ambassadors, heavenly citizens, new creations, joint heirs. Oh, aren't you getting pumped just hearing this stuff, huh? Okay, with all of the heavenly blessings that that uh, implies, we have strength, confidence, health, forgiveness, freedom, hope, eternal life. I'm just speaking this over you right now, wherever you're. Perhaps right now where you're sitting, you're you're like, you just don't. You're not there, right? You're questioning and doubting, and you're allowing life to kind of drag it in. I'm telling you, this is what God's declared over your life, huh? Because you're a new creation. You're a child of God. You're a citizen of heaven, destined for to live with your Father forever. And He's called you to live victoriously through Jesus Christ. So I encourage you, get into this. You know, after I'm all done with this, go back over, open up those verses, read them for yourself. Say, Holy Spirit, speak those into my life so they become a reality. So you too can actually live victoriously through the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus Christ, amen.